This episode of the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast is sponsored in part by Waterworks Lamps and Fly Reels. Looking to upgrade your fly reel? Upgrade to a Waterworks Lamps and Reel today. Try the all-new Waterworks Lamps and Lightspeed F and feel the difference. For more information on Waterworks Lampson, visit waterworkslampson.com. Now let's get back to the show. Hey, what's up, listeners? Uh, before we begin today's podcast, just a bit of housekeeping here for you. So, an a, amazing announcement that I want to make sure that you guys are definitely aware of. So, um, the first thing is, is on, yes, yeah, Stillwater School. We have a Stillwater School program this year at Skaching Lodge in beautiful British Columbia. So, for anyone that's ever wanted to learn Stillwater, this is the place. And your instructor is the one and only Phil Rowley. He and I have teamed up, we've partnered up to, uh, to bring you guys a in-person on water still water school and that's from june 24th to the 27th at the lovely and beautiful skiching lodge out in british columbia so basically if you've ever wondered you know about the still water fishery and how it works the the atomic the the insect life, the lake life, um, different tactics, you know, from, from subsurface to surface to indicator fishing, all that sort of stuff. Of course, Phil will do his, uh, his fly tying as well and what flies work for um, each time of the year and, and everything like that that works uh, on the still water topic. So making sure that that goes with you guys as well. So one of the, the really cool things is the lodge itself. I mean, for it's $1,600 per person. It includes everything you can possibly think of, except for your fishing license. You're going to have to buy that on the government website. So all your meals, all your drinks, all your boats, rod fees, uh, all that sort of stuff at the lodge is taken care of. Um, the lodge offers five-star food, super nice, um, beautiful setting, beautiful lodge. The accommodations are great. I can say this because I have been there and I just, I, that's why we're going back because it's the perfect setting. It's perfect lodge. There's beautiful wild rainbow, camelops rainbow trout in the, in the lake, sir. There's over 16 lakes. Um, each of them have their own private boat on them. So if you, you know, you're out, you're fishing, you want to take a, after the course, you want to go and fish your own private water. That's totally possible to do so. Um, you know, these are amazing. Like, I can guarantee you're not going to see another person on that lake. So it's just you and uh, and a friend or your partner, whoever it is that you want to bring with you, if, if anyone. And it's just, a, you know, to have a lake by yourself, to smash these massive uh, rainbows that just fight like tanks, um, just is so, so wonderful. So, again, that's June 24th to the 27th. It's a four-day, three-night program. Um, it's uh, at Skachin Lodge in beautiful... Uh, Kamloops, British Columbia, and it's also, you know, uh, Phil Rowley and I are putting that on. So again, that's the Stillwater School. One of the ways, if you guys are interested in, in this, learning more about this program or doing this program, and uh, it is going to fill out because we only li um, are limiting it to, to 12 people, is to reach out to me via DM, reach out to the Lodge, that's Kachin, S-K-I-T-C-H-I-N-E, Lodge.com, and uh sign up for the Stillwater School there. Or, of course, you could always reach out to Phil Rowley, flyfishing.com as well as another option. So these are all great opportunities. It is going to go fast. Make sure you get yourself in there. So I'm looking forward to seeing you. It's, again, like I said, an amazing opportunity if you've ever wanted to learn Stillwater. Or if you if you do know Stillwater and you do want to, like, brush up on some skills and learn from one of the Stillwater pioneers and legends, Phil Rowley. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Keenan. This is Season 3 of the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. In this episode, we aim to bring you the biggest and best stories from those who work and make our fly fishing industry truly great. The Fly Fishing Insider Podcast dives deep into the past, present, and future of all our guests, uncovering their amazing stories and journey. Join us each week as we interview a new podcast guest. Also, if you're new to the show or not yet a subscriber, make sure you hit subscribe after this episode. Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Today's guest, Phil Rowley. Phil, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's, it's great to be here. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, you know, I'm, I'm super excited because I, I'm, if they don't know, if the audience doesn't know already, we're going to be talking still waters 
which is like mine and your jam. So super pumped about that. I am excited uh, to to get this interview uh, on the way here with you. So why don't you tell the listeners who don't know who you are, who you are, and how you got into fly well, fishing? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let's take it right back. I was born in England. Um, emigrated to Canada when I was seven, so 1969, give you an idea how old I am. Um, and I had uh, introduced to fishing in England when I was, uh, you know, I'm thankful that my parents let me go with my neighbor. Uh, and we went, at that time we were chasing coarse fish, so tench, bream, carp was sort of the big thing um, in these uh, smaller lakes and, and parks. And then uh, when I moved to Canada, of course, wide open spaces. I lived in Chilliwack for about a year in British Columbia. Yeah, and then moved to Vancouver Island where I grew up. So wherever I was, I was always uh, chasing fish. And in my early twenties, I got introduced to fly fishing, and just fell off the deep end with that. Just totally fell in love with all aspects of the sport, uh, particularly the entomology, um, understanding the food sources. That became a real fascination. I think for the first time, I really understood or really took interest in what was going on in the water, rather than just fish live in water and you kind of throw these conventional stuff at them and um so started fly fishing um got my first fish on the fly on the first time i ever went fly fishing on the skagit river east of uh, vancouver mm-hmm. and that really hooked i'd never had a fish fight like that before you know when you just got you know the fish between yourself and the you know the fly the, the gear doesn't get in the way of the fish i just never had a fight like that before and i just got into my blood and that's basically all i've ever wanted to do since so i just dedicated myself um, to the sport and growing up in british columbia I'm living there for 35 years because i live in alberta now so i've been here about 15 years and uh you know the lakes in the uh, central interior of the province were easily accessible and uh, offered some world-class fishing and just sort of fell in love with lake fishing and that's sort of my forte although i do lots of other things i've you know been out to the east coast and chased striped bass on the fly i've um you know, do lots of river fishing whenever I can. I really like to use European nymphing tactics. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that's the equivalent of long leader coronamid fishing for lakes. Not a direct equivalent, but the same kind of leaders, flies, technique, presentation, all of that sort of uh, nerdy stuff, I guess you could say, to really get into the details of, of why things work and, and produce. Um, yeah, so that's... And, you know, I do now the... You know, started tying flies commercially, and that led to doing fly tying courses, and that led to doing fly fishing courses. And then I wrote my first book, Fly Patterns for Still Waters, and that came out, I think, just over 20 years ago. Now, I think it's actually running near the end of its production run. So I guess it's time for a new fly tying book. I've written a total of uh, four books now, the fly, uh, fly Patterns for Still Waters, uh, Brian and I did a book called Stillwater Solutions Recipes. I don't think it's available anymore. That's Brian Chan, good mm-hmm. friend of mine. Um, for those who don't know, and uh, sort of he's somewhat sort of well known in the Stillwater world. As well, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been good friends for many years, uh, and do lots of things together. Um, and then I did Stillwater Selections, um, and uh, then I've just finished uh, my newest book, The Orvis Guide to Stillwater Trout Fishing, which should be out in May. And I sort of threw my heart and soul into that book. Um, it's about 110,000 words, and just under 300 pictures. So in book terms, that's a little large. I think the publisher was a little surprised because <laughs> he <laughs> had a lower number of words and pictures in his mind, but uh, um, really looking forward to seeing the layout of it. It's ready to go to print. Um, and lots of excitement has been around that. Lots of people asking me about that. So hopefully it uh, works well. And, and ultimately, I hope it helps everybody um, when they go still water fly fishing. Awesome, Phil. Uh, I don't think you left anything out, so I guess we can end the show there. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just, <laughs> to, listeners. I'm just kidding. You know, what, Phil, you you mentioned all the nerdy and uh, getting into the nerdy, dirty stuff like that. So I want to do that. I want to go back to the beginning. I definitely do. I want to go back to the beginning of when you started still water fishing and what was it like. And I want, I want to, um, you know, was was there a learning like to, like talk about the learning period and what during that learning period and the bugs and you're trying to figure everything out. I know, I, you know, I don't want to age you here, but um, I know it's, you know, you're going back a few years here to remember uh, all those things. But I mean, 
walk us through that process. And obviously you had to have that love or everything like that light bulb moment where it just clicked. You're like, man, I, I love it. I figured this out. I'm at a, at a level of still water fishing that is, you know, pretty impressive. I yeah. I don't know if you ever get at the level, the motto for my fill roll leaf fly fishing empire, such that it is, is um, because you never stop learning because you, to me, you never do. That's one of the attractions to this great sport is you're always learning something new every day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, from the smallest, littlest thing, to something with your equipment to something about fish behavior, something about uh, lakes, just whatever the whatever it is, you're always learning. And, and particularly on those days where you, you know where Mother Nature's really you know putting it on your chin, and you're not having the best of days out there. You know, I think on the drive home, the, the evaluation you process you go through as to why things didn't go as as planned um, really offers that opportunity to learn because <clears throat> you talk about. When I first went out on lakes, it was frustrating. Um, it was, you know, lakes are vast, yep. uh, kind of featureless, uh, you know, compared to a river where you can see the other bank. In many cases, you can walk across it. You can read the, you know, the character of the water surface and get sort of a measure if you were a fish, where would you hide? But when you're on a lake, it's just that, again, that flat, featureless, where the heck would a fish be? And there's a lot of trial and a lot of error. <laughs> And not much success at first, it seemed, and mm-hmm. it was. And of course, we don't. Back then, I didn't have. We don't have the resources we do today. There was no internet. Um, everything was in books. There wasn't a lot written about fishing at all. I guess the first real stillwater book uh, for British Columbia and Western Canada was the Gilly when it came. Oh out. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. classic book. book. I still have yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, classic. And it's still the lessons in that book are still as applicable today sure. as they were yeah. back then. And uh, you know, maybe there's some refinements in, in uh, you know gear and flies and things like that, but um, not necessarily refinements in flies, just different flies. Um, you know, um, I remember Randall Kaufman, uh, American author, wrote a book. Uh, him and uh, I've got blank on the other co-author, which is really bad, but it's Lake Lake, uh, Lake Fishing on the Fly, I think it was. Or There wasn't a lot of literature out there to read and study, right? And, uh, of course, Brian wrote some things as well, and, uh, you know, so it was hard to learn. Well, one of the first light bulb moments for me was actually on Corbett Lake when I, you know, when I started learning to fish coronamids, there was mm-hmm. no strike indicators. You used a floating line, you had these leader formulas made up. We used to use, you know, the the tippet of choice was Maxima, and you would make these leaders up, these formulas and different sections of different uh, varying diameters all the way along, and you had this long 20, 25-foot knotted leader, unweighted flies, beat heads weren't around, really dating myself here. Um, and, um, you know, you used to have to cast this long leader out and wait for an eternity to sink. <laughs> I was going to say, um, wait, waiting for that to sink must have been fun. Oh yeah, and well, lots of time to talk and socialize if others are around, <laughs> and uh, and then that painstakingly slow retrieve, right? When you, yes, you know, you say if you figured you got your retrieve right, you, you cut that pace in half again, right? And and then I remember, you know, all of a sudden the line went tight. I felt it take as subtle as it was, and hooked my first fish on coronamids, and that was that. This is fun moment, right? I want to do this again yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's such a technical fishery. Um, as far as learning all the nuances of chronomic fishing and learning different ways, I think today a lot of people just associate chronomic fishing with hanging something under an indicator, and that certainly works very, very well when I do it. But I also love to fish. You know, if I have to fish a lake one way only, it would be a floating line and long leader. Um, interesting. Because- oh, interesting. Like you're straight up like. Um- yeah. Like for a chronomid fishing for a lake, if you were to come to a lake, um, say me and you were to hit Hathium, um, yep. would you fish it like w- uh, without an indicator? You would you would just do uh, naked? Yeah, I fish it a number of different ways. You know, generally, you know, I've got some general guidelines. I cover these in the new book. But, you know, if, if I'm fishing water, let's say 15 feet or less, I'm probably more prone to using indicators. Yeah. Um, because you just have that, you know, the beauty of an indicator is it really helped with the learning curve because it helps you control, to me, probably the two elements people struggle with when they fly fish lakes is getting their flies to the right depth and keeping them there and moving them slow enough. Because most of those food sources in lakes, they're not Olympic athletes. They don't have rocket packs strapped to their back. Sure. They're yeah. not yeah. scooting around at warp speed. And, you know, when I do schools and, and, and guide, I see people struggling because they make the cast. As soon as the fly hits the water, they're pulling, right? And it's, um, 
you know, you got to let it sink, you know, relax. You can mm-hmm. sit in the chair of the boat, cross your legs, you know, get a sandwich, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let it all sink and settle and then, and then start working with it. So, you know, again, back to that shallow water. And of course, when you fish in really skinny water, it's just easier to have that strike indicator there to hold the fly out of trouble. Right. Um, but when I start moving out into deeper water, then I'm more likely to use or consider using that floating line long leader tactic uh, because it's such a great method for not only chronomets but just about everything else that swims in a lake or crawls in a lake or moves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also, you get the, you know, the casting, you know, because you're playing, to me, you're playing with four elements with what we call the naked technique because the leader has no indicator on it, so therefore it's naked. Uh, we're playing with the weight of the pattern, so it's generally a, a weighted, you know, bead heads or yeah. uh, internal weight on the fly. Uh, the speed of the retrieve, dead, dead slow, because if you go too fast, that fly will start to climb out of the water, up through the water column and, and get out of the, the depth zone you're trying to target. And usually in lakes, we're trying to target that, let's say, one to three feet off the bottom, because that's where all the food is. That's where it's nice and safe for trout to cruise around without worrying about eagles, ospreys, and so much of loons and those kind of critters that are trying to kill them all the time. Um, and the leader length, so you can get down there, and then um, the sink time to let it get down there, right? So those are tough elements for a lot of people to master. You know, the the leader length they can figure out because it's just a formula. Generally, I'm using a, uh, a tapered leader to start with, uh, like a 15-footer. Uh, I use a lot of the... Oh, I'm, fortunate enough to be a real ambassador, so I use a lot of, obviously, their products. And I'm using that leader to, which is quite the opposite of an indicator leader setup, but I'm using the differing thickness to sort of slow the sink rate down, so when it gets down, I can track that fly back through a, a zone just by, mm-hmm. again, playing with those four variables. And then, uh, you know, so 15, if I want to make a 20-foot leader, it's just 15 foot or at five feet. I'm good to go. It's pretty simple. It also has some backbone on it. It'll help cast and turn over because I think most people, once they learn to fly fish on nine-foot leaders, nine-and-a-half-foot leaders, maybe a 12-footer, and then to ask them to throw a 20, you can just see their eyes look at you like you <laughs> Yes, them to do something totally illegal or immoral or something, um, and uh, you know, so they're a little intimidated by that. Um, but learning that method, it, it teaches you patience and it teaches you touch. So the patience is to let those fly, let that line, and, sorry, fly and leader sink. Um, to have the patience to do that because sometimes we're thirty seconds, a minute, which when you're sitting there just apparently doing nothing seems like all eternity it's like being stuck in a lineup at a drive through while somebody tries to order a four course dinner uh, <laughs> you just want your cup of coffee right <laughs> um, so that takes a, a while and then and then the touch yeah. right to, because the takes are subtle uh, sometimes it's just the line moves like you might have a little squiggle of it's it sitting fish. on the surface and it just starts to straighten out that's a fish yeah. right because one of the key elements of the retrieve is if the line has a, I use those little line squiggles if you're on a day that's light winds or next to no winds that's a, a great way to figure out if you're moving the fly slow enough um, because if you move the if you move the fly too fast retrieve too fast um, that is going to cause wake on the surface and you don't want that mm-hmm. and you don't and and when you pull on fly line, that's what takes that little memory squiggle out. So if you're moving so slow that you're basically dragging that fly line across the surface and that squiggle stays in, right, and all of a sudden it starts to straighten, the only way it's going to straighten is something is pulling. At one end is you retrieving too much if, if that straightens yeah. it, or if you're not, then the pull is coming from the other end, and that's in the form of a fish, so you want to set the hook. So that's why I love that method. It's very techy. Um, you know, it takes again, that patience and touch to master and then get comfortable with it. Um, but we use other methods as well. I love using um, slow sinking uh, lines when fish are spread out or it's really windy and throwing long leaders or indicator rigs isn't a smart thing uh, because just for, you know, self-preservation. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, because we tend to overpower casts in those situations, which causes tailing loops, which causes leader tangles and a lot of frustration. And also that surface chop um, really can start pulling and jerking on, on the line and maybe negatively affect your presentation. You bet. Yeah. So, we're, yeah, so we're talking lines like a hover that sinks at one inch per second. And uh, shorter leaders, I can get away with a, you know, typically I'll start with a seven and a half foot leader as a, for all my, almost all my sinking lines as a um, sort of the backbone and then add the tippet from there. So I'm probably fishing nine or 12 feet. 
um, with a flyer where I am outside of British Columbia, we can use multiple flies, which is a definite presentation advantage. Um, and, um, you know, we can get that uh, line will sink under the surface chop, but the sink rates, you know, when you're talking one inch per second, you may have to, if you're fishing that into 15, 18 feet of water, you're talking two minutes to let that thing get down. Yeah. Right. So that's a real test, test of patience. You know, I use the sweep hand, the, the minute hand on, on my watch to keep myself honest with my timings. And of course you want to do that because if you hook a fish, um, you want to duplicate it. So if you knew what you let your fly sink to, you know, chances are where one fish is cruising, the rest of the gang aren't too far away. Um, so you can get down there because depth is really critical. Um, I feel in, in still water fishing, um, uh, it's a key player without it. It's one yeah. of the, one of the four key players for yeah. sure. Well, I for use, sure. yeah, I use an analogy called DRP because everybody is so pattern focused, right? If somebody's catching fish, it's the pattern and, you know, there are so many good patterns out there nowadays, and the best pattern in the world, I don't think, is going to produce if it's not in front of a fish. Yeah. And um, so the DRP analogy comes um, from depth retrieve pattern. That's sort of my priority. So if I'm in an area and I'm not catching fish, I'm kind of going, is the fly at the right depth? Have I got it down? And I touched on that earlier, usually near the bottom to start with. Um, am I moving it at the right pace? And that's usually nice and slow, a little erratic pauses, yeah. you know, things like that. And then I start playing with the pattern. So in a scenario where I'm sitting in an area and um, I believe, I've, you know, I've got a pattern I've got confidence in for that, you know, situation. I'm moving the fly at the right pace. I know I've got it at the right depth. I'm more likely to move because there's nobody home. There's no fish there. Because usually if they're around, I find they'll eat within about 10 or 15 minutes if they're around because that's what they're doing, right? If you put something down there that they're in the mood for, delete it mm-hmm. um, but everybody likes to blame the fly because if it's not the fly then unfortunately it's probably the angler <laughs> as far as their presentation skills right and that's not meant to be a negative yeah. but that's you it know is. everybody it's true. yeah i agree you know, i agree with yeah that. if anybody if you're in a group of anglers and somebody's catching fish the first question is what fly and of course that's the most guarded secret out there right for many it's it's uh, you know and out of their experience and the effort they put into developing that fly, I certainly respect that. But, you know, sometimes they could, you know, there's those anglers that are less than truthful. They'll tell you what they're using and they're using something totally opposite. Um, there are so many pet names for flies nowadays, even if they told you the name. Exactly. You know, what, the heck, yeah. uh, what the heck does that mean, you know? Um, um, but, um, and, but they will, you know, a lot of times I'll just, if somebody's doing, I can just say, hey, you're doing well today. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, get them near the bottom and they'll say yeah right off the bottom a foot down they will you know if you're indicator fishing they're usually pretty good with that Mm -hmm. and you can observe whether they're casting a lot or not casting very much to get an idea of retrieve speeds or they'll just uh, you're moving it fast you're moving it slow no i'm just creepy crawling and okay that's fine and then you use your powers of observation from there right see what bugs are around if there's any shucks on the surface what time of the year understanding hatch charts and when bugs are most likely to be available and all of that stuff so yeah, absolutely. And then the other method, you know, getting back to fishing chronomets deep is dangling, fishing vertically uh, with fast sinking lines and probably water. I've done it as shallow as 14 feet. It's usually water clarity that dictates it. You know, clearer water, fish are less likely to let you sit over top of them and hang things down at them. But, um, you know, usually it's a 20 foot or, or deeper uh, thing. And that's just fishing, uh, you know, type six, type seven, density compensated line straight down below the rod tip, you know, setting your fly so it suspends about a foot off the bottom and letting it sit or hang, as I always joke, as long as you can take it. And then, you know, the people always criticize still water fishing. Oh, it's so boring at times. Well, to me, the cure for boredom is move the fly. Get engaged, start, and then you start, in the case of dangling or fishing the, line, the fly vertically, is just moving it up through the water column. And the takes typically occur with that method you know, right at the bottom, or just as you just almost see the leader down. coming into the, they follow it up, and then they have a decision to make to take it. And because we're fishing short leaders, you know, we're usually using maybe two sections of tippet. I might use a stiffer, um, sorry, thicker, uh, higher, stronger diameter uh, main portion that connected to the fly line, just so it, you know, when you, if you're using a loop to loop connection, it's not going to, the risk of a thicker line is less likely to cut into a, the welded loop and damage your fly line, mm-hmm. right? Because fine diameter, you know, it's you got the cheapest one of the cheapest parts of your equipment destroying a 
you know, nowadays a pretty expensive part of your equipment, mm-hmm. you know, and then adding a, a shorter section to that. So in the overall length, it might be a three foot butt section of, let's say, 2X, and then a final section of two feet of 3X, for example. And then down to your fly or, or hang a fly off. If you fish multiple flies, you'd hang them um, probably. 24 to 18 inches apart, maybe 36, somewhere in there. It just depends where you're trying to spread them out. And the, the, the fun thing about dangling is you don't. You could cast it to the teeth of the strongest wind. You can all sit around and socialize. You don't have to stare at indicators or watch for line squiggles or any of that stuff. Just hold the rod because yeah. the takes, if you've ever, I'm sure you've done yeah. it, the takes are... Ferocious. Uh, ferocious. Somebody once said in the seminar, I did in the States, it's like a train taking a mailbag. And with, that is an excellent analogy because it's, <laughs> it's just heart stopping. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I've seen rods bent around gunnels. Uh, the first time I did it was on Dry Falls Lake in eastern Washington back when I float tubed a lot in the early 80s. And um, we were just sitting out there in 20 feet to sort of heard about this method, um, sort of give it a try because the fish weren't in the shallows very much. And, uh, you know, the rod tip was inch or two above the surface and within, got the take and within a blink of an eye, that rod tip was down between my legs, out behind my back, um, you know, in, in the blink of an eye in less than a second. And it's just, and I got the fish in, it was like 15 inches long. So if you hook something massive, you know, five pounds plus, um, the takes are, are scary, um, and I joke when I do on the water coronam in seminars, I have to show that method last because if I showed that method first, nobody would indicator fish or floating line, long leader or all that stuff. They go, I just want to go dangle. I like that take. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I do. I do know what you mean by the take. Like the take is phenom- yeah. it's phenomenal. It, I mean, it, it's it's heart stopping, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I love it. I love watching that rod just boom. It's under. It's It feels yeah. like it's under your boat. Um, you know, and the cool thing about it is, though, is like in BC we can fish, and I fish solo a lot. Just for those yep. that know, like I don't like too many people in my boat. If you're my, <laughs> if you're my son, that's fine. But uh, other than that, I'm I'm pretty pretty much against that. Well, I think most of us like to spread out too. If you're with yeah. multiple people, um, you know, if you're with a group and working together to solve the daily problem, um, if you're in different boats, it we allows you more. more. Yeah. So uh, exactly. it's just good to have sometimes somebody else along to help push and carry and, <laughs> and Phil, like, that's, why, that's why we have kids, right? We can yeah. <laughs> load them up. Of course, mine are in their early, mid-20s, so they're a little more, uh, less, less cooperative at times. Yeah. They, they don't want to go anymore. My, mine have no, they want to go. Oh, do they? they oh, want to okay. go. Okay. Yeah, they, they love fishing. Awesome. But, uh, in fact, they complain I don't take them often enough because I'm always off doing something or going somewhere else. But, um, yeah, I know you were saying you can fish two rods in BC. And, um, and it just works. So, I know with us, like, so all... all you know, if it'll, if the wind and the, the current, just the way the, the wind's pushing the like, um, if, if it allows me to, to do so, I'll do a dangle off one, like off the, yep. th- with the one rod. Put it and, in the rod holder? And, yeah. in the rod holder and I'm indicator or, or, you yeah, know, stri- work another like, fly. yeah, or working another fly, like stripping or something like that. And you know what, like how many times like you get, you get that cast and all of a sudden you look over you're like, Oh crap. You just literally drop yep. the other rod and, and you're just on it. Right. Or you've got two indicator rods and it's always what I call the dead rod, the rod that's not in your hand that seems to oh, yeah. get all the action. And then, so you pick <laughs> that one up for a little while and then put the other one down. As soon as you pick up the other one, the one you just put down starts yeah. going off, and, and it's crazy. Yeah, BC, you can do that. And in some of the states I've traveled, uh, I know California for sure, and I think some other states, If you, there's different state regulations, but you can buy, if you purchase a second license or some kind of license amendment, um, you can fish two rods as well with multiple flies, so that's wow. fun. I, I, do, I do like fishing the droppers. It's, you know, after living, I always joke I lived in BC for so long because, you know, BC used to be able to fish droppers, but not anymore. I think that changed in the early 80s, as I recall. And then uh, it's all single fly. But, uh, you know, multiple flies have... It's not about catching um, multiple fish. In fact, your method of fishing two rods by yourself is Is arguably about catching more fish. (laughs) Um, Whereas um, dropper fishing... um, you know, we use them in a, what we call a washing line technique. Um, 
which is uh, putting a buoyant fly on the what we call the point fly, the one furthest away, mm-hmm. and using that in conjunction with your your fly line type um, to suspend other flies off droppers, uh, like clothes on a washing line. That's where it gets its name. So in the fall months uh, in Alberta, we have some really outstanding water boatmen and back swimmer fishing. It's much better. It's, it's a predominant insect out here, probably from early September right oh. through till almost freeze up. Trout get on them and just want them all the time and more and more. And we have some just unbelievable um, falls where the, the adults are, are, you know, that's the first time in their life they can actually fly. So they're taking flight and coming back and it just drives the fish crazy. So, you know, in the late fall, we you could be fishing in 10 feet of water, but five feet of that water is long weeds. So really you've got five feet of workable water. Yeah. So this washing line set up with like an intermediate line, clear intermediate, and a you know a foam based or deer hair, spun and clipped deer hair pattern on the point, for example, of a back swimmer or a boatman, and then another one off a dropper. I can work that effectively, work that five feet of free water, right? Because the the buoyant fly in conjunction with your fly line choice keeps everything off up out of the weeds. Um, you know, droppers, multiple flies that weight. Um, mm-hmm. You can fish different hat, different stages. You can fish a bloodworm and a pupa, for example, and chironomids. Um, when damsels and mayflies are hatching, they often overlap. And I've had days where damsels are hatching, they'll only eat a calabatus nymph. And then calabatus are hatching, for some reason, they only want damsel nymphs. <laughs> well, That's... you can fish those two together yeah. and let the fish decide, right? Yeah. Um, we also use them um, to attract fish to the fly. So we fish, you know, everybody's fishing attractors nowadays, boobies, blobs, fabs, yeah. large, gaudy, mobile flies, whatever you want to use. Fish will come in. They're curious. We'll see that monstrosity, <laughs> that obnoxious fly, uh, and uh, may eat it, which is always good fun. Um, but they will then perhaps turn away from it. But then there's a couple of other nice flies um, down along the further down the line and they'll take one of those right so that fish you can pull in from a distance because they'll come over to investigate whereas you know even though they're eating the tiny stuff you're asking a lot sometimes for fish to see it or be attracted enough or be in a, a frame of mind to come over and eat it from a distance when you're competing with obviously natural insects that are coming off right in front of its nose right mm-hmm. so there's lots of tactical advantages um two droppers and of course it's just the fun when you hook a fish you're never sure what it's got right so it's a bit of a christmas element to it <laughs> <laughs> christmas element i love it yeah. what's in the prize <laughs> <laughs> exactly. box. what's in the prize bag? exactly that's, that's funny you know you, it's funny phil you talked about um you know blob, blobs boobies and fabs um let's let's look at that because uh when you started Stillwater here in bc like that that wasn't a thing until what um I'm going to say like 10 years ago, maybe like, is it just started? Actually it was, yeah, it was actually in 1993, the world champion, I think it was 93. The the world championships, the fly fishing world championships were held based out of the Kamloops area. So Tunkwa was a lake. Community. Paul, I think Paul was a lake community. I can't remember all the lakes, the venue lakes, uh, Roche. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter, but obviously, you know, we're on our home turf. We, as Canadians, I think everybody, we do well. And competition fishing is completely different than, um, you know, what we do recreationally. First of all, you can't anchor. It's all uh, lock style techniques with a drifting using a drogue, which is a very effective way to fish lakes as well. Um, and totally different um mentality to mm-hmm. it, different flies. And of course, the, year, the English anglers came over, the Welsh and the English, the Scots, and they had been fishing boobies and those kind of flies for a number of years, and, and they, they did well. And it's just since that, it's slowly been gaining uh, popularity, and they're becoming more and more widespread in use now. So, we're, of course, you mentioned them, we're talking about boobies, you know, flies with big full eyeballs, um, which probably big round full eyeballs gives you some clue as to why the fly was named that. Uh, fabs, which is uh, actually a unique thing because in England, some of the fisheries were banning the use of boobies. Um, not yeah. so much. Um, and it's more because, you know, if you, if you fish, getting off a little bit here, if you fish a fly, um, a buoyant fly too slowly, you lose connection with the fly. So there's slack between you and your fly. And, of course, a fish comes up, puts something in its mouth, feels no tension, no resistance, is more inclined to swallow it, right? And that's why you can risk with those flies them taking it deeply. Um, So you always want to keep your pace up with those. So the 
the the mentality over in some of the English reservoirs and, and lakes that they fish um, that it wasn't really, you know, um, sporting, I guess you could say. So they started to ban f- flies with foam in the front. And um, so somebody, I believe it was a Scottish competitive team, said, well, what if we put the foam in the back, right? And well, I guess that's legal. Uh, and so it basically took a blob, which you're probably familiar with as a, just uh, fritz or you know the body materials, chenille-like yeah, yeah. material they use they use for the bodies. Um, that's got no foam in it at all. It's just a, looks like a. I guess the closest North American pattern might be an egg. And um, so what that we fish those obviously um, as well. And then putting the split foam tail in the back uh, became the fab, the foam arse blob. Yeah, yeah, so I remember. It. I remember well, um, Brian had told me that story when I uh, when I went to interview him. And of course, the beauty of the foam too, yeah. being competitive anglers, and you know, I legit. think we're all competitive. And they could come in at the end of the day, and of course, you know, when you've got the successful fly, you got to run the gauntlet. Everybody wants to look or see your ask. Yeah. Um, they would come in and actually just before arriving at the landing stage, they would take the pinch the foam tail off, out, gone. Would they? Right. Yeah, and now it looks like a blob. Totally different. Looks similar, but behaves differently, right? And, uh, oh, yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> Interesting. I love it. I love yeah. it. I love that. Yeah, so we've got fabs, we've got yeah. boobies, we've got blobs, and then, of course, there's the watsit, or jelly mop, I call it, yeah. and that's basically uh, a mop tail on the back end of a blob, right? So in England, they call them watsits, W. O T S I T because it resi- the the mop tail resembles a corn chip, a brand of corn chip or corn crisp they sell over there huh. called a what? So that's where that comes from. So I have all of those in my box, it, and, well, and that's what I want to talk about. So like what you know we have those in our boxes, and I know like they they don't represent anything in in our still waters. Why are fish so why why are they well, so they productive? Do, they don't yeah. Um, I, can, and, uh, I think it's important. Like that, the, yeah, that's that's in an imitative way, and that's where blobs have really come in popularity. Mm-hmm. You know, typically um, late summer through early fall is when I've seen trout most feed on Daphnia, which is a form of zooplankton. Yeah, and and that's because zooplankton feed on phytoplankton, and phytoplankton is light sensitive. So during the day, that phytoplankton recedes deep in down in the water. And that's, you know, predator, prey, all that stuff. And, of course, the trout have also sort of slid out into that deeper water in that warmer, quote-unquote, summer doldrums period because the shallows just don't contain enough oxygen for them to spend any, any amount of sustained time in there. So they're out in deep. You just got this natural intersection of prey and predator. And, um, you know, we are hanging blobs. Um, I, I like to hang beadhead blobs to, um, so they'll hang tight. Um, on the leader, so I don't, you know, sometimes you can, you can, those, if you fish on weighted blobs, first of all, you're going to wait forever for that thing to sink. Um, and, uh, because the materials are kind of synthetic, so they, they don't absorb water and sink like a natural material might. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it takes a while to get down, but there's also the risk of that fish taking the fly deeply because you're not really tight to the fly, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I use a lot of tungsten beads on my blobs to make sure I can get them to hang as tight as I can. And what we're doing in that situation is hanging them under indicators and using picking colors of blobs that match the zooplankton that they're feeding on, right? We're kind of playing what I call the color card because we're not tying size 92 flies, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, I'm fishing 10s and 12s, um, yeah. you know, yeah. in those wild colors like blushing sunburst and and uh, prawn and, and biscuit and all these different colors. And, of course, tequila, which is a very popular combination with the, that safety orange front and a yellow bus on it. Um, and that's what we're doing. We're kind of imitating the color of those um, zooplankton, but they're sort of targeting them mm-hmm. as clusters. They're just sort of zoned in in color. But outside of that, and I wrote up, this is a whole chapter in my upcoming book, is trout don't always take our flies out of a feeding response, right? They're they're curious, so they'll sample. They'll put things in their mouth they're not sure of, right? You've probably seen underwater footage in rivers and streams where trout are zipping out and grabbing a drifting twig or something. Yeah. And, eh, that wasn't what I thought it was, it's spitting it out, right? Well, fly fishers, as long as they put that fly in its mouth, we're happy we're, with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, good enough for me. Um, so curiosity, um, territoriality, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
you strip something through their space, they instinctively want to snap out at it, right? That, you know, they'll chase larger fish, will chase away smaller fish, you know, defend their space. Um, and aggression, you know, they're just, they're predators. So you, you're, you're flipping that sort of aggressive predatory switch in their head too, because when we're fishing attractors or so fishing flies that are loud and obnoxious, you know, those fluorescent colors that stand out, we're fishing them aggressively. Um, you know, they shake, they wobble um, as well with the materials we use and, and using those fast strips as well to tr- get them to chase them down and just crush them, right? And so, they do. They, you know, they, yeah, well, oh, they do. Oh. They're a lot of fun to fish, um, and they have their place. So to me, it's generally, you know, we even fish attractor chronomets nowadays. You know, we're we're doing the same things. We're exaggerating the size of the prey item, yeah. the colors, uh, and how we fish them. Right? That's another p- component of the attractor thing. Um, so we're generally fishing larger flies um, because we're not dealing with selective mm-hmm. feeding situation, um, and the colors are just these obnoxious colors. Um, you know, the traffic light effect. I call it. That's what they call it in England, where you you're taking mirage opal mylar and putting it over holographic mylars, or particularly red, and what the effect is, is as that fly turns and rotates in the water, it reflects different colors, right? It can appear red, no, it can the, appear green, it yeah. can appear a yellowish color, and that's where that traffic light effect yeah. comes from, because it's like the colors on the traffic light. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I had a seminar, just to close this off, was, it was in Manitoba, and we were chronomet fishing, and we'd done a throat pump, and the fish were, had 14s in them. You know, predominantly black and you know, kind of anti-static bag colors, and and we were getting the odd fish, but nothing um, of any you know, not as good as you would think when you pump a fish with twenty-five wiggling pupa in it. You, you think you match that hatch, you should mm-hmm. do pretty well. And we were limping along, and then one of my students had to run an errand in town, lost his boat, came over to the rest of the group, and you know, makes his first cast, boom, gets a fish. Well, that's just beginner's luck. That figures, right? Well, after about his fifth or sixth fish, now we're now we're sort of like prairie dogs were popped up and were attention and asking and he, he says to me well Phil it's one of your flies off yours and Brian's online store and I, I joke that well you know I'm not going to have any of those with me right because you'd never have it's just the way Murphy's Law goes and he was fishing a size so the fish are eating 14s and he's fishing a size 10 3XL uh, Chan's Beadhead Chronomet Bomber which is just basically a sort of a black thread body um Two extra long curved nymph hook, mm-hmm. wire rib, big white bead. Like, definitely yeah. not what they were eating. But they saw that and they were like a kid on Halloween candy when that thing hit the water. They wanted it, right? So, just that's an example to me of a tractor style chronomet fishing where, in that situation, you're exaggerating the size of the prey item. You're just, a pre, a, I guess, appealing to their greed, right? They just, yeah. why eat that, 14s when look at that thing, you, right? You, why eat, why, why eat a, a nugget when I can have exactly. the whole chicken? And you right? know what? You're right, though, Phil. I, and there's been days, you're right, 100%, because I have actually fished that fly yeah. on days yeah. and, and I've slammed on, you know what I mean? And you're pumping, yeah. and I'm like, I don't know what. I don't know what why they're hitting my fly, and but I'm not going to argue it. And no, you don't. And you and, know what I mean? Uh, or, yeah, like. And what or you, sometimes you know like, you're fishing chronomans, yeah. hanging them still like everybody else, and nothing. And then you give it a pull just to sort of wake yourself oh, yeah, up yeah, or yeah, do yeah. something, and all of a sudden, boom, boom, it goes down, right? And then you do it again after releasing the fish, and that's the way they want it. They want it. You let it settle and give it a one foot pull. And of course, that raises that fly up mm-hmm. on the pole, and then it slowly settles. And trout being predominantly sight feeders, you know, any animal with big eyeballs relies on heavily on sight. Um, they see that motion, they come over, right? Yeah. And they just see that big morsel hanging there or that big shiny one that sticks out like a sore thumb. They're just like, well, I'll take that, <laughs> right? So I've, you know, the it's almost, and you see it in other disciplines and river and stream fishing is not matching the hatch, going like completely the other side of it, right? Yeah. And, that, and that's an example of that. So, yeah, the attractors is not all about triggering a feeding response. It's about triggering some kind of response out of territoriality, aggression, or curiosity, right? And at the end of the day, it's all about trying to catch a fish. And whatever flips the switch, 
I'm okay with. That's that's funny. It's funny. And I was just thinking it's hilarious. I mean, you look at it like out here in Canada, you know, we have our, our Tim Hortons and someone brings Tim Hortons to work and there's always that specialty donut of the month that just sticks yeah, out. That starts the fight. Right? That starts the fight. <laughs> and you look at it, you're like, I kind of want it. I don't want it, but you, you want to try it. You know what I mean? But I mean, yeah, no, it's exactly what it is. It's kind of funny. I like it. So, hey, Phil, you mentioned the Stillwater app. Um, for those yeah. that for those that don't know, um, tell us about your Stillwater app and you and Brian have created that and everything like that yeah yeah we were approached by an app developer to if we would be interested in doing an app specific to still water fishing so i want to say that was about three years ago um i'd have to check file dates <laughs> and what the app is it's a free download um on both um for android on google play and apple on iphone on your um iTunes, Apple Store, um, and it's just look for Stillwater Fly Fishing app, it's pretty, and um, so it's a free download. Um, there are there is some subscription based content, so you can purchase subscriptions for monthly, annually, um, quarterly, and uh, some people get confused. They just see the monthly. You got to remember, just if you when you get to that page, if you're deciding to subscribe, just swipe the page from right to left. It'll re- reveal the other subscription options. And what we've done with this app is. Uh, broken it into chapters like entomology, uh, techniques and tactics, um, equipment, flies. We actually have uh, um, uh, leaders and knots. And what we've got under all of these chapters is um, video tying tips or video tips in general on, on all those different chapters, right? So we got, again, fly tying, leaders mm-hmm. and knots, all those things. Some of it's free, some of it's subscription-based. And the beauty of this app, there's probably close to 200 video tips on it right now is once you download all or a portion of the content that you want to download to your phone, you can take it wherever you go and you don't need Wi-Fi to access it, right? So you could be out in the middle on a trip in a remote area that you don't have cell service, but you want to um, go to the fly tying section and tie up a coronament pattern or a dragonfly nymph pattern or something. There's some patterns there you can follow along with if you've got a portable tying kit or you're stumped by a bug you've never seen before. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we've got a video of that bug and you can, you know, see what it is, how it behaves, how it moves, um, you know, and then go to the techniques and, and tactics section and see some presentation tips, retrieves, um, using indicators, setting indicators up, uh, you know, fishing you know, vertically dangling again. We got all that there. So, and we're continually trying to add to that uh, app and, and tips. Um, you know, the pandemic has had a bit of an impact, of course, getting together and all that kind of thing mm-hmm. to film and get editing done. But uh, you know, we try to update it with you know three to five tips on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. Um, and put them on there and keep it going. So, it's, uh, what, and what's the like? What, what was your goal when you created that app? Because I, I know you're. You know, it's the app's quite popular with the Stillwater community yeah. out here. What was your goal with that app? Um, ultimately, like when you guys set out, to... we jokingly say it's like having us in the boat with you, but you know, obviously, we can't be be there with you to help yeah. all the time, much as I'd like to or Brian would like to. It's mm-hmm. just it's not practically possible. And just to have a resource, I think both Brian and I are very committed to to passing on the education. You know, all the things we've been fortunate to have been taught to us or we have learned along the way. And um, and again, I talked right in the beginning of this uh, podcast about the learning curve on lakes can be pretty steep. And a lot of people get frustrated and just leave and never come back uh, because they haven't had that success or don't understand it. So we're just trying to help mm-hmm. provide any and all assistance we can in a kind of unique, portable way um, that you can have with you, a resource that you can take with you all the time. Because you can't always take your laptop or your, your PC at home or whatever on the water with you right exactly yeah. <laughs> at least at least i don't <laughs> so. you know, you know, most of us want to leave that stuff alone right so there's always that section that says well you know why do you want to be your iphone but yeah. God, the iphone nowadays is i often joke if it rings you're not quite sure what's wrong with it right it's all the other things it's got on it um you know you've got google earth which is a great help when you're exploring new water or you're on a new body of water and trying to see where areas you might want to go um you know, it uh, takes pictures, um, mm-hmm. all those kind of things. So mm-hmm. it's become a, you know, uh, an incredible important part of our lifestyle. Lifestyle, though, of course, it can be a curse sometimes as well. But um, you know, I try to look at it positively. That it has more benefits than it has 
the negative things about it. Yeah, I uh, I always say to people, I prove my math teacher wrong. I do walk around with a calculator in my pocket. It does cost me two hundred dollars yeah. a month, but I do. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I also I'd like to say with my writing, if my English teacher could see me now, right? Exactly. English, right. Who cares what a noun is? <laughs> when am I ever going to use this when I leave school? Yeah. Exactly. Right? Actually, so it's funny. Pay attention. You know, it's funny. I I was actually talking to. Um, Yesterday, I was talking to uh, Jim uh, Bertucci from like from Scott, and uh, we were talking about how much we rely, rely on technology. And we were just saying um, how I, I used to know so many people's phone numbers. Besides my wife's phone number and my own phone number, I don't know anyone's phone number anymore. It's like, I feel <laughs> yeah, it's bad. It's funny. It's like yeah, if you don't, um, yeah, it's if it's not on my phone, I'm you know. I'm in trouble, right? Yeah. <laughs> or just, or what you say, just text me or email it to me, and then I, I'm paranoid. There's no um, loss of interpretation, no memory issues, no uh, jotting down information wrong. You can copy and paste, so you take the the human, you know, the human error element out of it. Um, way more accurate and efficient. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, all right, Phil, let's uh, let's circle back here. So you also, um, you know, getting with the the app and transitioning from the app. You've also now transitioned. Um, into like here you are getting all techie into the online stuff right in the online courses that you've now developed with uh, one of the local guides out here in Kamloops that last part of this amazing podcast is brought to you by rock treads add aluminum to any boot or shoe and wade like a water buffalo through the gnarliest river you can find wade safer wade harder with rock treads You've been listening to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, tell us by liking this episode and subscribing to the show. Also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. See you next week.